So we will continue with the fairy tale from Andrew Lang, A World of Fairy Tales, entitled He Who Waits. This is a story for older children, older kindergartners or um, older siblings, families maybe. So I shall backtrack a little bit and continue on. For a long time he remained with the merchant, who gradually trusted him with all of his business and gave him a large share of the money he made. When his master died, the young man wished to return home, but the widow begged him to stay and help her, and one day he awoke with such a start to remember that twenty years had passed since he had gone away. I want to see my wife, he said the next morning to his mistress. If at any time I can be of use to you, send a messenger to me. Meanwhile, I have told Hassan what to do. And mounting a camel, he set out. Now soon, after he had taken service with the merchant, a little boy had been born to him. And both the princess and the old woman toiled hard all day to get the baby food and clothing. When the money and the pomegranates arrived, there was no need for them to work any more. And the princess saw at once that they were not fruit at all, but precious stones of great value. The old woman, however, not being accustomed, like her daughter-in-law, to the sight of jewels, took them only for common fruit and wished to give them to the child to eat. She was very angry when the princess hastily took them from her and hid them in her dress. Then the princess went to the market and bought the three finest pomegranates she could find, which she handed the old woman for the little boy. The princess also bought beautiful new clothes for all of them, and when they were dressed, they looked as fine as could be. Next, she took out the precious stones which her husband had sent her and placed it in a small silver box. This she wrapped up in a handkerchief embroidered in gold and handed it to the old woman. Go, dear mother, she said, to the palace and present the jewel to the king. If he asks you, what he can give you in return, tell him that you want a paper with his seal attached, proclaiming that no one is to meddle with anything you may choose to do. Then, as she now knew what it was to be poor, the princess filled the old woman's pockets with gold and silver pieces and gave one last instruction. Before you leave the palace, distribute the money amongst the servants. The old woman took the box and started for the palace. No one there had ever seen a ruby of such beauty, and the most famous jeweler in town was summoned to declare its value. But all he could say was, If a boy threw a stone into the air with all his might, and you could pile up gold as high as the flight of the stone, it would not be sufficient to pay for this ruby. At these words, the king's face fell. Having once seen the ruby, he could not bear to part with it. Yet all the money in his treasury would not be enough to buy it. So a little while he remained silent, wondering what offer he could make the woman. And at last he said, If I cannot give you its worth in money, is there anything you will take in exchange? A paper signed by your hand and sealed with your seal, proclaiming that I may do what I will without hindrance she said promptly. And the king, delighted to have obtained what he coveted at so small a cost, gave her the paper without delay. Then, to the king's amazement, the old woman took handfuls of gold and silver pieces from her pockets and distributed them to the servants. Amid a, a chorus of grateful murmurs, the old woman took her leave and returned home. The fame of the wonderful ruby soon spread far and wide, and envoys arrived at the little house to know if there were more stones to sell. Each king was so anxious to gain possession of the treasure that he bade his mess messenger outbid all the rest, and so the princess sold the two remaining stones for a sum of money so large that if the gold pieces had been spread out, they would have reached from here to the moon. The first thing she did was to build a palace by the side of the cottage, and it was raised on pillars of gold, 
in which were set great diamonds, which blazed night and day. Of course, the news of this palace was the first thing that reached her father, the king, on his return from the wars, and he hurried to see it. In the doorway stood a young man of twenty, who was his grandson, though neither of them knew it, and so pleased was the king with the appearance of the youth that he carried him back to his own palace and made him commander of his whole army. Not long after, the widow's son returned to his native land, no, not long after this, the widow's son returned to his native land. There, sure enough, the tiny cottage where he had lived with his mother, but the gorgeous building beside it was quite new to him. What had become of his wife and mother, and who could be dwelling in that other beautiful palace? These were the first thoughts that flashed through his mind, but not wishing to betray himself by asking questions of passing strangers, he climbed up into a tree that stood opposite of the palace and watched. By and by a lady came out and began to gather some of the roses and jasmine that hung about the porch. The twenty years that had passed since he had last beheld her vanished in an instant, and he knew her to be his own wife, looking almost as young and beautiful as the day of their parting. He was about to jump down from the tree and hasten to her side when she was joined by a young man who placed his arm affectionately around her neck. At this sight, the angry husband drew his bow, but before he could let, the, let, let fly the arrow, the counsel of the wise man came back to him. Patience is the first step on the road to happiness, and he laid it down again. At this moment, the princess turned and, drawing her companion's head down to hers, kissed him on each cheek. A second time, blind rage filled the heart of the watcher, and he snatched up his bow from the branch where it hung, when words long heard since seemed to sound in his ears. He wins who waits. And the bow dropped to his side. Then through the silent air came the sound of the youth's voice. Mother, can you tell me nothing about my father? Does he still live, and will he ever return to us? Alas, my son, how can I answer you, replied the lady. Twenty years has passed since he left us to make his fortune, and in that time only once I have heard any news of him. But what has brought him to your mind just now? Because last night I dreamed that he was here, said the youth, and then I remembered what I have so long forgotten, that I had a father, though even his very history was strange to me. And now tell me, I pray you, all you can, con all you can concerning him. And standing under the, under the jasmine, the son learned of his father's history, and the man in the tree listened also. Oh, exclaimed the youth when he heard the end, while well, he twisted his hands in pain. I am general of an army. You are the king's daughter, and we have the most splendid palace in the whole world. Yet my father lives we know not where, and for all we can guess may be poor and miserable. Tomorrow I will ask the king to give me soldiers, and I will seek him over the whole earth till I find him. Then the man came down from the tree and clasped his wife and son in his arms. All that night they talked, and when the sun rose, it still found them talking. But as soon as it was proper, he went up to the palace to pay his homage to the king and to inform him of all that had happened and who they all really were. The king was overjoyed to think that his daughter, whom he had long since forgiven and sorely missed, was living at his gates and was besides the mother of the youth who was so dear to him. It was written beforehand, cried the monarch, you are my son-in-law before the world and shall be king after me. And the man bowed his head. He had waited and he had won. I hope you enjoyed that.